Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman, and I'm the marketing director here at AAEES. First off, we want to thank one of our patrons, Black & Veatch, for sponsoring this webinar. Here with us today, we have Miguel and Shauna from DC Water. Miguel and Shauna are both process engineers, and they're responsible for process reliability, system reporting, and project commissioning. Both are licensed environmental engineers and ABC licensed wastewater treatment operators. Today, Miguel and Shauna will be dis discussing the Animox treatment process at DC Water. Before we get started, I just wanna mention that you'll be able to message your questions at the end of the presentation. Once the presentation's over, you'll be able to type your question into the attendee chat panel on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll also share their email address so you can email them directly with any additional questions you might have. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, Miguel and Shauna. Thank you for joining us today and we're ready when you are. All right, good morning. Um, you can Everyone can see my screen, correct? Yes, I do. All right, well, thank you, Marissa, for the introduction. We will do our best to share our operational experience in regards to the commissioning and maintenance of the uh, this project with this group. Um, I would like to mention uh, that we are well-versed in the theoretical science behind this project, uh, but that isn't necessarily going to be the focus of this session. Anything that we can't answer confidently, we'll be more than happy to either redirect you to the right person or answer via email at a later time. So now that I got that out of the way, welcome, welcome. Thank you all again for coming uh, to today's webinar. Again, my name is Miguel Miranda, and my partner in crime here is Shauna Martinelli. We are part of the process engineering group here at DC Water. And um, we are kind of like the metaphorical bridge between the design engineers and the operational staff. We are responsible for like what Marissa was saying, um, uh, reporting and whatnot, but are also responsible for training, equipment troubleshooting, IT work in some rare cases, and the aforementioned project commissioning, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. Our latest labor of love was the commissioning of the filtrate treatment facility, or FTF for short. Um, one second. There we go. Um, so what is it that we're going to be talking about today? Uh, a little bit about who we are, who DC Water is, for those who may not know. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what Animox actually is and why we chose Animox. Um, I want to quickly review the project timeline and the contract structure to give a little bit more of a temporal structure and a little bit more realism to this discussion. As fun and great as this new talking about this new mystery bug is, um, this is still a project that we had to implement as a commissioning team. Um, so I definitely want to go over um, what all that entailed. I want to, we also want to go over the equipment. Um, oh, I should probably turn off my webcam so that everyone can see more. Here we go. There we go. Um, so we want to go over some of the uh, the equipment because uh, in in order to make the bugs work, it, there was a whole network of systems surrounding it uh, that needs uh, that we need to understand. Um, I would also we also like to go over the control strategy, um, which goes over like how we are able to make the bugs do uh, work to the best of their ability. Then I want to uh, go over our ramp up story. Um, I like to mention that Animox wasn't the only new combination of things that was uh, used during this project. The combination of the belt filter press and thermal hydrolyzed sludge as feed, the invent mixers and neuros blowers. It's gonna be a, a fun time. Um, long story short too, it was a bit of a trial and error to get the, all that working together, but we'll go all, over all of that at a later point. Then I'd like to discuss our operational demonstrations and the data that we obtained from there and showing off really what these bugs can do. Um, then last but not least, I'd like to go over some of the lessons learned. So a little bit about uh, who we are, DC Water. Um, DC Water Blue Plains is one of the largest advanced wastewater treatment plants um, in the world, spanning over 150 uh, acres in size and treating wastewater from over 2 million people across the DC metro area. 
Our average flow is about 384 uh, million gallons per day. It was enough to lo- fill up our local baseball stadium on a daily basis. Uh, Cause I know sometimes like just that one number uh, can be difficult to wrap your head around. Um, we also are able to reliably treat uh, 555 million gallons per day um, during our main facility during any rain event. And then our capacity, our max flow is about 850 million gallons, which is a scary, a bit of a scary number. I remember we reached something close to that in 2015. It was a, it was a stressful day, but we were able to handle it um, without too much of a problem. We also produce a class A biosolids uh, here at Blue Plains called Bloom. It's a crazy strong fertilizer. And this is a little image of a of the daughter of a friend of mine who has basil. That all came from one strand of basil when we were using our class A biosolids. It was it's very strong. Um now Blue Plains uh operates via traditional um, traditional series of treatment steps, screenings, primary settling, um, secondary treatment, disinfection. What makes us an advanced wastewater treatment plant is that we also do uh, nutrient removal through our night D night process. We do this because of our stringent discharge limits. Um, total nitrogen is 300, uh, 3.8 milligrams per liter of TN. Um, and our total phosphorus is 0.17 milligrams uh, per liter. Um, these given to, uh, established by the EPA. Now to get to the class A biosolids, um, we thicken our primary sludge and our biological sludge, blend it, and then send it through the thermal hydrolysis process, also known as CANBY for us. And then from there, it goes through an anaerobic digester. After the anaerobic digester, um, we then dry the cake uh, via uh, the belt filter press, where it then becomes the bloom product that we mentioned before. Unfortunately, a byproduct of the CANBY process it, um, and the anaerobic digestion process is a very highly concentrated ammonia side stream um, reaching up to concentrations of like 2,500 milligrams per liter. And if not treated before running to the head of the plant, it can lead to severe overstressing of our main biological systems, which can lead to violations. But that's where our labor of love comes into play. That is where the filtrate treatment facility then uh, helps reduce that high concentration um, to more manageable levels at the head of the plant. So what is Animox? What is this mystery bug that everyone has this hot craze over? Um, Animox is a group of anaerobic uh, ammonium oxidizing bacteria that do not require um, oxygen or methanol to to convert ammonia and NO2 to nitrogen gas. Um, The demon system itself is the combination of using Animox and AOBs to convert ammonia into nitrogen gas. The image that you see on the screen um, is the traditional nitrification denitrification cycle. And it shows how demon then integrates itself into that cycle. And um, it shows that less oxygen is needed and uh, less organic substrate, uh, actually no organic substrate is needed in order to produce this product. You know, on paper, sounds great. Less op- operational costs with the blowers and less of a methanol demand overall. So um, yeah, <laughs> it sounds great on paper so far. Now, the As mentioned before, due to the combination of like can be anaerobic digestion, we have, you know, a high ammonia side stream. Uh, once everything is said and done off the, off the belts, we have about a 1,600 milligram per liter of ammonia heading towards the head of the plant. It dropped from the previous number because of certain dilutions at the belts, but that volume and that concentration can still end up being a shock to our system. So, with that, with the high ammonia need, and then the ability for the Animox to consume that ammonia, and with uh, data, previous data showing it can consume up to like 90%, it was only natural that our attention went to the demon system. And of course, the potential to uh, reduce our methanol costs and overall like lower costs um, through our mainstream was also a great bonus for us. So project timeline. Um, this labor of love came into works 
uh, in around 2009. That's where we, uh, the SDC Water, uh, decided, yes, this is kind of where we, this is what we want to do, and this is what we want to proceed with. Um, from there, uh, we worked with Black and Veatch in, in order to create the original design in 2012-2013. Uh, once the bidding process was completed, the following year, uh, World Waterworks, which is our biological contractor, Emerson, our PCS logic developers, and ourselves, DC Water, began working together to create the control strategy that would hopefully lead to the success of these bugs. Um, in 2015 is where construction began. Um, and this is also where uh, process engineering, um, so Sean and I, really started to become integrated into this process. Uh, then later in the mid-2017s is where we started uh, finishing our loop testing. It was where construction started uh, to, to be completed. We did our loop testing. We did uh, oxygen uptake tests with the blowers, and we did our mechanical wet testing with the uh, construction contractor. Once the mechanical um, aspect of this project was completed is where we then had our initial seeding and ramp up in late 2018. Uh, it then took about a year, year and a half, um, for the seeding and for the growth and splitting of the other reactors to be accomplished. And it wasn't until 2019 that we did our first operational demonstration. We had two operational demonstrations, one that was supposed to test out all of the reactors at a normal load. And then we had a second operational demonstration that was supposed to be uh, really pushing the, the biology to its limit. And that happened in the 20, um, mid 2020. Since uh, since the second operational dem demonstration, we've been working on um, certain operational optimizations. Now that we've been running this for a while, there are certain things that we wanted to improve on and enhance on. And that's what we've been working on uh, recently. And we'll talk about more of those enhancements and those changes um, later on in the presentation. And as we are doing those enhancements, we're also working on transitioning um, the process over to operations. Thanks, Miguel. So one of the key pieces of our long project timeline that we wanted to highlight was our unique contract structure. It was unique in that we had two distinct contracts, during the first of which World Waterworks, the demon supplier, was directly under the contractor for the construction and mechanical and wet testing. Think about that essentially as, does the facility and the equipment meet the needs of our biology? Um, after we got through beneficial occupancy and acceptance, we actually contracted directly with World Waterworks to complete the biological testing and ODs. So does our biology meet the needs of the facility or can we treat the full available ammonia load? Um, this differed significantly significantly from how most of our recent capital improvement projects were structured such that typically we require a contractor to be responsible for operations of a of the facility for a year before turnover, in which case they're typically doing shadow training with our operators, um, and then we accept the facility. As we accepted the facility after the first stage or the initial contract with the contractor, we worked through biological seeding and ODs. Um, and essentially this gave us great visibility and ownership into the project, allowing us to see deficiencies and issues early on. Um, it really gave us time to modify and correct them, before we got through or even proceeded with our ODs, um, making us more of the overall system integrator. So we do always have a system integrator in our typical contract structure, but they're looking at um, communication between devices and control programs or PCS. But we more became the um, system integrators of how do these individual components and trades work together. Uh, we were even doing the PMs and CMs directing work during that year to two year period where we hadn't accepted the biology yet. So it really gave Miguel and I insight into what it was going to take to long term run the facility successfully. And we think that it's important to highlight these distinctions because it set us up um, to really have a much better understanding than we, we typically do in our other contract structures. So pulling back a little bit more, um, just to get a scale of things, and I as an engineer really like seeing the scale and the equipment, so we're going to touch on that really briefly. So as mentioned, belt filter press material that's in square one is being routed from our solids plant part of the plant um, in the south there, all the way up essentially to the head of the plant 
Um, going through number two, which is dilution water on its way, we have the ability to utilize plant service water for dilution or reclaim secondary effluent. Um, we much prefer using PSW because the quality is much better. Our RCEP typically is turbid and occasionally septic because the lines that um, intersect with our filtrate treatment aren't always flushed, aren't always running. So we've never um, utilized RCEP during uh, biological treatment. We did utilize it for some of the wet testing. And that's routed to number three, which is the actual footprint of the project we're discussing. And you can see there that that diluted filtrate actually goes into our two feed tanks with a, our approximately half an MGD and capacity. And we um, feed from those feed tanks into our six individual reactors, which, there we go. Um, so we have six basins. They're just under a million gallons each and 30 feet deep. Our operating um, levels are typically between 26 and 27 feet to 22 is our low operating level. And each individual reactor is has two dedicated Neuros turbo blowers. No, thank you. Um, you can see the them here in our blower gallery. So we have a total of 12. Uh, they are have internal PI controllers, but are operated via PCS. So all those HMIs you see, we don't allow our vendors to require um, individual vendor skids. Everything needs to be incorporated into our um, Emerson Ovation system that we utilize here. So we'll talk a little bit about the keys in our control strategy later on. They have their variable speed blowers, which allow us to have three distinct operating modes, which utilize DO, airflow, or constant speed. And um, we like these because of their footprint. They're also really quiet and um, they're lubricant free. So they're uh, air um, supported bearings, which require us to keep up on our PM maintenance or our filter maintenance. But other than that, they're nice little units that you can start and stop frequently. And that's realistically why we selected these Neuros blowers for this project because of their ability to be started and stopped often. Um, they're quiet, they're compact, they're a nice little skid there. We also have four invent mixer aerators where that air is supplied to each mixer under the um, Mixer itself, there's a sparge ring with 24 orifices, and those pr provide fine bubbles in this parabolic mixing pattern. Um, they have high and low operator level protections as well, of course. And I should note that we are one of the few applications that utilize these invent mixer aerators in combination with the decanters you'll see here on this slide. Um, and we are the largest application of them, so they're the largest Schreiber decanter SDK 450s um, that we know to date. And uh, this is a unique combination of Neuros, the Invent, and the decanters. Each tank at one point did have a decanter in it. Um, <laughs> and you can see here with the empty tank, just for a better visual, uh, that's 4,000 pounds of stainless steel right there. And originally, the supply air from those small pneumatic pumps in the cabinet nearby would supply would create an air seal essentially that would keep this decanter on the water surface and then we'd blow off that air when we go into decant allowing it to settle into the water interface and then there's a there's a, a flow control valve and actuator on the other side of that wall penetration allowing us to decant out the supernatant um, flow within our five feet of working volume. Uh, each reactor also has this hydrocyclone assembly. Each assembly has 10 individual hydrocyclones on it. Those are our red funnels you see in that visual there. Thanks, Miguel. And um, the feed to those are fed by a large submersible pump that sits in the bottom of our reactors. Those cyclone feed pumps essentially feed this pre-screen assembly. It's really just a basket strainer for the most part. It has um, smaller orifices. Its intent is mostly to pull out material that falls in the reactors or could clog the assembly, but we also get reasonable amounts of shearing of the Animox while we run both the pump and through the pre-screen. So we'll talk more in the future about how that shearing has been helpful for us. Um, that feeds the assembly. 
Uh, and obviously our underflow, which is Animox, is returned back into the process. That heavier Animox is going to drop out. And our lighter AOBs, NOBs, ordinary heterotrophic organisms, we can either recycle them back into the reactor as well, or we run normally in a recycle, normally open recycle configuration. But there are instances where we need to waste that biology. I should note that roughly 80% um, efficiency when we're talking about the hydrocyclone. So we do lose about 20% of that Animox when we're typically wasting. This here is um, essentially, you're going to hear Miguel talk about just how important our instrumentation is as we walk through our controls. Uh, this is a patented float that um, was provided by World Waterworks that houses our pH, DO, and conductivity probes. Um, they have the conductivity probe separated out on an SE200 from the 1,000 meters because in other applications they had seen some interference. Um, we want to note that typically World Waterworks provides these with Hawk um, as their supplier for all of the probes. However, we found that um, maintenance of the Hawk pH probe in particular is a bit cumbersome, frequent, and we have a very hard time getting our calibrations to pass in our colder winter months. So we've actually trialed and utilized, we have installed to this day, um, Enders Hauser and Knick pH probes. Um, we saw much better response from our Knick probe. So we are utilizing in one of our reactors, both a Knick pH and DO probe. And we intend to, once we get to the end of the useful life of the remaining Hawk probes, transition over to Knick, specifically because it makes it much easier to calibrate and maintain. They're more robust. Um, we don't make a habit of replacing our um, salt bridges and our pH probes here at DC Water. So these Kinnick probes are actually much more robust and allow us to uh, really get through those cold winter months where calibration is very slow and you can bring the unit inside to calibrate it and then put it back outside. So putting all those pieces together, giving you this um, thousand foot overview, Again, our ammonia from our belt filter press, which we target to dilute down to 1,000 milligrams per liter. We've not um, done any testing with more than 1,200 milligrams per liter as, as an entity altogether. So that includes research. So typically, we're targeting an influent um, of 1,000 milligrams per liter ammonia. We have the ability to add phosphoric acid if we have a need for additional phosphorus. Since we got through OD1 and 2, which required um, specific nutrient levels in our influent. We have not utilized this system and we've seen reasonable results without it. Um, that's fed to our feed tank, which is then fed to our individual reactors, which I've already discussed the equipment um, in more detail. So I'm going to kick this back to Miguel to sort of explain how we utilize these together. Thank you. All right. So now that we have an understanding of all the different pieces of the mechanical equipment um, and a rough idea on how the biology is supposed to work. Let's all put that together and see how they function in tandem by going over a control strategy. So I like to recall, uh, have everyone call, that the goal of the facility is to reduce the highly concentrated ammonia from the belt filter press to a more manageable level before returning to the head of the plant. We accomplish this by utilizing the demon process, the demon system, in a stepwise sequencing batch reactor. That's what these uh, reactors um, are essentially are. We allot specific times into each one of these different steps, these fill, react, fill, react, settle um, step, and we uh, give them time to, uh, to fill the reactor with ammonia and you then use the biology to consume. Um, when we hit that max level, uh, we then settle the biology at the bottom, clear the supernatin at the top, and then we rinse and repeat. Now, how do we do that specifically? So with such a large concentration of ammonia, the largest influencer, um, yeah, the largest influencer of pH in these reactors is ammonia. So we can loosely say that pH is equal to about uh, uh, is equal to ammonia concentration. So during a particular batch, the name of the game is pH manipulation within a narrow pH band. So as you can see in this image, 
um, as pH as we feed, pH rises, and then as we aerate, pH decreases. So it's the idea of feed react, feed react as the level continues to rise. And each one of these being the individual steps that I was mentioning before in our stepwise sequence batch reactor, where we allot specific times to do each one of these particular steps. Um, but, uh, one more, there we go. So now ammonia is, Animox is delicate. You can't necessarily just toss it in a tank and expect it to work. Part of the control strategy was not only uh, creating a um, system that allows the, bio the biology to do what it needs to do, but it also um, was to create an, an ideal environment to allow the Animox to grow so it can get to that level of robustness that we need it in order to treat that high concentration of ammonia. So thanks to our flexible operator selectable control system, we were able to implement um, different modes that catered to the different steps in the biological growth by simply changing the times um, at each, in, each one of those individual steps that I mentioned before, the aeration step, the filling step, the mixing step. And that's what these tables are kind of like, you know, t tabular representations of what that is. So the first one, uh, intermittent feed mode. Um, it was, it was focused on creating an, the ideal chemical environment for the Animox. In this mode, we were able to slowly lower the pH um, to the appropriate levels, like the high sixes. We were able to drive down the COD, the carbon, that, the remaining carbon that was in the reactors. We were able to acclimate the AOBs to the higher ammonia concentrations um, and give them the ability to just create just enough NO2 so that the Animox um, can remain active at all time as they continue to wake up and grow. Um, now that we're talking about growing, once we start seeing that growth is when we switch from intermittent feed mode to timed mode. Um, time mode serves as like the transitional step uh, once the ideal environment was made. We slowly lowered the aeration times and increased the feeding times as to promote this biological growth, this animox growth. The idea was that the more ammonia that was introduced in the reactor, the more NO2 that would be created via the NO AOBs, and then the more animox, is there, the more ammonia and NO2 that would then be consumed by the animox, all under a very controlled environment, a very specific environment that we had to be very much on top of in order to make sure it was done successfully. In order to do that, though, during this phase, it required a lot of sampling and a lot of precision. As we mentioned before, Animox is delicate. If we allowed that chemical balance to go out of whack during this phase, we could have easily have killed off the Animox. Luckily, we were very adamant and very on top of it, and we um, were able to successfully get past this time mode to, um, to the point where we felt the biology was robust enough, where it can then control its own feeding steps which is where we then hop into our last mode, which is the mode that we're currently operating now, and that is pH control mode. During this mode, we have the biology, di again, dictate its feed and aeration via the use of the pH and DO probe. If you, again, recall, uh, pH is loosely connected to ammonia, and then the oxygen that the AOBs use to convert ammonia to NO2 is being controlled by the the, the DO. At this point, we can consider the biology to be robust enough um, where it can then, uh, again, control how much it requires on its own. And the idea was within that pH range, that that's, uh, narrow pH range that we mentioned, as the pH uh, hits the, like, the low pH set point, um, we then focus on feeding, which would then subsequently raise the pH. And then once we hit a high pH set point, we then focus on aeration, where then, you know, subsequently the pH will start to decrease. And then we would continue the cyclical for, uh, uh, motion in pH as the level in the tank continues to rise mm -hmm. until we hit high uh, a level and then settle and then decant and then we rinse and repeat. Oop. All right, so now that we have finally gone over a lot of the background and the theory, um, I'd like to start talking about what actually happened with us, our actual like ramp up stories and our uh, ODs and whatnot. So 
Once the mechanical checkout for the filtrate treatment facility was complete, it was to then time to receive some biology and work towards that ramp up. Our first shipment of, our, of Animox seed was received from Strauss, Austria in late 2019. Um, it, took a, it took a couple of weeks in order for it to get to us. And um, luckily the biology doesn't necessarily die off uh, when there isn't enough food. It, may, it merely goes into like a hibernation state. Um, and then it just takes a while for it to like wake back up. Uh, we actually found this particular aspect of Animox to be particularly helpful for operation purposes. And this is something we'll go into more, uh, bring up uh, again in the future. But um, whenever there was something going on with the reactor, we actually were, felt comfortable with the ability of just leaving the reactor off while we took care of the issue and then turned it back on. So it's not like uh, some flow throughs where like if you stop feeding for a good amount of time, you might kill off your biology. That might be said for the AOBs, but the AOBs are very quick growing. So even if we had um, a reactor down for like a weekend or something, it, would, it wouldn't take too long for it to pick itself back up the following day. Um, so talking about um, the seed sludge layover, I have a fun little story. So point A is Strauss, Austria, and um, point B is Washington, D.C., where we are. Uh, these, long story short, if you're sending something overseas, be sure to be specific on your destination. Um, somehow in the conversation, the D.C. part of Washington, D.C., was omitted, and these uh, little scoundrels got on a mini vacation before they came to work for us. They went via boat past the uh, the Panama Canal and somehow ended up in Washington State, and then they had a uh, railroad trip between Washington State to us. I'm a little jealous of these guys. These guys actually got to do the the train ride that I never got to do, but <laughs> don't worry. The, after their vacation, we put them straight to work. Um, oop. there we go. So what, as we were about to put them into work, um, we had to recognize that we were also under a very unique set of circumstances, right? Um, not only did we have Animox, which, uh, coming in, which is a very new, uh, uh, process in on, in on itself. We also had a bunch of other different co co combination of new things that we wanted to, um, we wanted to test out and take advantage of. So the research team wanted to take advantage of this particular situation and add another kind of experiment to the mix to see um, if Animox would have a better response depending on its initial environment. Uh, the two different modes or two different environments that uh, we wanted to test out for this initial seed of biology is called nitritation denitritation mode and nitritation only mode. Um, nitritation denitritation mode is essentially where we are creating the quote unquote ideal environment where the helper or, or organism, so like the AOBs, um, would become fully acclimated to the higher ammonia concentrations and any inhibitory compounds that could have been found in the filtrate and have them ready to begin operations as soon as the Animox was introduced. So essentially the only um, missing aspect and the only thing um, that would be essentially limiting the Animox is the Animox itself, right? And then nitritation only mode was where is uh, essentially food in abundance, where we created an environment where there was, a, uh, where both the AOBs and the, uh, sorry, the AOBs and the Animox had nothing necessarily holding them back. They were both kind of about at the same starting point um, in terms of like growth, but they both had plenty of ammonia, of course, within, um, within reason, and they had plenty of NO2 in order to consume. Uh, in this mode in particular, uh, we had to be a little bit more specific with our environment, so to speak. Uh, our pH had to be high, it had to be 7.5 to 7.8, and we had a very low loading rate of ammonia, less than 0.1 kilogram of ammonia per meter cube per day. Um, and we used, we tried to maintain an NO2 concentration of less than 10 milligrams per liter. The reactor was only aerated enough in order to create that, uh, that specific number of NO2. And we would also then have the extra NO2 denitrify any incoming carbon um, during the anoxic mixing step. The goal was 
also to part, uh, partially nitrify some of the remaining ammonia loads that was going through to get, you know, some treatment benefits while we were enhancing the, the actual Animox themselves. Um, now, during these modes, it is also very important to note that NOBs were also very quickly selected out, regardless of which mode it was, because the NOBs, um, if were allowed to proliferate, all they would be doing is taking food away from our Animox. And if not careful, they can get really out of control um, and it'd be a real pain in the butt. Uh, so we also had to make sure that that was taken care of uh, in both of these modes. So this graph um, shows the... Uh, specific activity rates for the AOBs and NOBs on Animox on the Y and the next time on the X. The research group did weekly um, activity tests on all these biologies during the ramp up process. Uh, recall that I said that the uh, that was great that Animox didn't really die off when there was a lack of food that it just fell asleep. Well, this image kind of like shows that when we first had our bi uh, biology um, brought in, uh, they were only asleep for maybe about a month, but it took about like three months before the Animox actually started seeing any sort of response. Um, so they were pretty lazy at the very beginning, but once they started waking up, they really started growing rather quickly. Um, I also wanted to, uh, um, to, to show, th show this that A uh, AOBs, as soon as you're given the they're, they're given the ability to like uh, to work, they started waking. They started multiplying and growing rather exponentially. But that's something um, a bit of a hiccup that we also didn't really foresee when we were first ramping up. And we'll get to a lot of the other hiccups later on. But I just wanted to mention here: um, if you don't keep control of the overall population of biology, even the helpful ones like the AOBs, you can still end up in a bit of a weird situation. What happened during this time in the boxes is that we allowed our AOBs to grow a bit too much. And when that happened, um, they oversaturated the reactor and didn't allow anything to decant. And that's why even though we see a big growth spike here in AOBs, they just suddenly dropped off. And same thing here, as soon as we started saw the Animox grow, we had a sudden drop off because this oversaturation of AOBs didn't allow for anything to settle. And that was one of our first hiccups during our ramp up process. And uh, we'll go over some of the more, some of the other hiccups. So this is kind of like the first uh, headache that we ever encountered during this project. Um, after that though, uh, it took about another year, year and a half for the ramp up of the, other of the other reactors to occur. And it was at that point where we finally were able to start our first OD. And at this point, I'd like to pass it off to Shauna to talk about OD1. Thank you. So we have, as we've mentioned before, we have two operational demonstrations. Uh, the first of which was, well, I want to say that Miguel's startup modes really only represented three to four months worth of data. Now that was in one particular reactor. So we had to get five reactors in total prepared for our purse OD, and that's where that year and a half lag came from. Um, but the, the first operational demonstration with World Waterworks was focused on um, essentially a 30-day operational period where no substantial or significant process changes or reductions in feed specifically, but below the design load could occur. That design load's uh, 0.35 to 0.4 kilograms per meter cube per day. I personally in operations hate speaking in these metric um, units. So that's for, for those of us who run things more frequently, that's really about 200 gallons per minute um, of, with an influent concentration about 1,000 milligrams per liter of ammonia, and we were able to complete four decants in a day. So we actually agreed with World Waterworks to reduce the, um, the test down to only requiring five reactors instead of the six, mostly to reduce our workload. Um, as 
process engineering was the ones developing, I mean, uh, grabbing samples to be sent off to the external lab for nitrogen speciation, which we used as our official um, results for the test for removal. But uh, essentially we needed to, because there's such a lag, I'm sure you're all familiar with external lab samples, um, this 30-day test, we couldn't wait the two weeks to get the analysis back. So essentially we were a triplicate sampling. Um, we used our own lab to uh, confirm or verify the external lab results. But as far as most of the discussion we're having here, when it comes to Miguel and I running the plant, we're utilizing a, a hawk calorimeter and um, NO2 strips. And we're taking at, at times several NO2 strips a day during different pr process times, but also um, we're running Hawk for ammonia, NO2, and NO3 daily. And those um, Hawk readings essentially are what drive our process changes each day. So it's just something to think about, be set up so that you can run these samples, you can grab them. I actually even forgot until just saying this now that originally we didn't have a sink or like a real lab space set up in the facility, and we had to have one put in after the fact. Um, so uh, Go ahead and go to the next slide for me, Miguel. Thank you. So the key parameter for OD1 acceptance was essentially um, ammonia removal. The contract required each reactor to pass a minimum removal rate of 72% with a combined system removal rate of 76%. And in this regard, as you can see in the graph, um, OD1 was a great success. The average removal rate was, was actually approximately 86% with um, some reactors doing better than others, as can be seen by this plot here. I should note that the gaps in the days were um, weekends and holiday samples that were not taken. So we approached this in the with the assumption that if a Friday and a Monday sample verified the performance over the weekend, we backfilled those as having the same performance for those two days. Uh, you can see there's some wider gaps in there in the beginning of January, um, and that's because if there was a need to change a process parameter, um, in particular to reduce feed because of performance, we didn't actually restart the full 30-day test. We essentially paused it and picked it back up when the performance was being met again, or the, load, the design load was being met again. Um, having successfully completed OD1, we, we actually decided to choose reactors two and five specifically um, to move on to ramp up for OD2, which Miguel's gonna talk in length about. But we chose five because even though it was our first reactor um, seated, it actually demonstrated the uh, lowest performance in the OD1. So we wanted to really challenge the biology with our second test. And we chose two because it was sort of all over the place there. Um, it was, you know, started slow, got and ramped up a bit better during the um, duration of the 30-day test. Based on the performance of the reactor's ammonia removal for our unique setups, you can leave it there. That's okay, Miguel. Okay. So um, I just wanted to highlight that Miguel went through in depth the um, various startup modes, but based on the performance in OD1, it didn't lend to us having a clear preference between those two modes. So nitritation, denitritation versus nitritation only, there was not a performance that was indicative of one of those startup modes being better than the other. Um, actually, can you go back for me, Miguel? Because you'll see that reactor three, four, and five, which were in night denite mode, um, while one and two were in nitritation only, there's not a clear winner here. Reactor one did to the best, two did just all right, and three and four had moderate performance. Um, I mean, two didn't do, do as well. So the driver here was, um, well, we did try different startup modes. The key was essentially just, is your Animox robust enough? Do you have enough um, residual or high enough activity to proceed in pushing your biology? Now we can go to, thank you. Um, so the big driver here, and Miguel alluded to this, was what were our takeaways or lessons learned? Um, essentially, when the biology is stable or self-sufficient, it's very resilient. Um, when you're troubleshooting, the best course of action is to put a reactor offline, address the issue, and come back to it because that Animox will just hibernate. It's pretty robust. You may see a brief drop-off in your AOB activity, but you're able to get those um, back doing what you need them to do fairly quickly and, and simply. Um, I'm going to discuss more at length the importance of the chemical balance, but um, we also realized 
that there was this need to waste excessive biology, and that included RALBs that were trying to um, promote the pathway for, for um, NO2 production, we essentially hit a brick wall where we had great settling. We're doing weekly settling tests and we went and we grabbed a sample and we had such a high rate where you saw everything drop off there in Miguel's trends. We weren't able to have anything settle. So we had to waste um, fairly consistently to keep up with that. Next slide. Okay, sorry guys, there's a delay on my end. So before um, before OD1 began in late July 2018, World Waterworks really wanted to achieve a high ammonia removal rate. There were some um, monetary assignments in the contract for achieving better removal than the target. And so they decided to drive our pH down um, and if we consider pH as loosely synonymous with ammonia concentration, when we reduced our pH to 6.4 to 6.5, so as Miguel's talking in pH mode about that small dead band, we're typically actually operating within a 0.05 of a pH. So our high and low pH limits are essentially 6.6 .6 to 6.65. Um, but when we push below that 6.6 .6 number, as you can see in this graph here in our reactor, you'll see you have good ammonia removal um, as you drive your pH down. But you'll see in the bottom, the circles, those gray circles, there, you also see this uptake in nitrate concentrations, and that happens pretty quickly. Um, it, it happens at an alarming rate, actually. And NO3 is obviously inhibitory to Animox. So we essentially had to utilize some trial and error, and um, we learned the importance of this chemical balance that we alluded to. Here you'll see um, in this table. So after some trial and error, we had to deal with uh, aggressively wasting our, our NOBs and utilizing free ammonia inhibition to essentially get rid of our high nitrate accumulation. So we did this by slowly raising the pH in our reactors to about 7.1 while simultaneously reducing our DO set point. That's going to favor our Animox as well. And we would feed less and continue to waste. And in about uh, two weeks' time, we were able to get the NO3 back to our appropriate levels. Um, and you could just see in this table that at that 200 milligrams per liter ammonia or that pH of 7.1, you actually have that free ammonia of 2 to 2.5 milligrams per liter, which is inhibitory to our NOBs. So once we went through this hiccup, and, and I should state that wasting your NOBs is really difficult because you're losing AOBs, Animox, and at times you can be overshearing your Animox, which interferes with the ability of it to settle and stay in your reactor. So these kinds of hiccups actually require a lot of operational presence. Um, you're, you're performing those daily hawk, but you're also looking at observations of your filter paper to, to keep good inventory of the size of your Animox and the quantity. That's a very qualitative thing. Um, Miguel and I joke that we're like kind of the sommeliers of these Animox mm -hmm. bugs. A lot of stuff we do in the field is really like a visual representation. You're going to start seeing better pictures here too. Um, well, we made the the definitive decision that we will never drive our pH below 6.6, .6, not a decimal lower. We don't allow it. And we right. have not gone back there since. You're fine. You're good. Okay. So for some of our animation to work, Miguel is the one controlling this screen, folks. So, um, so then can you go back to that sinking floating solids? Awesome. Thank you. So outside of learning that we don't want to lower our pH below 6.6, .6, um, we observed through prep for OD1 and then really struggled during OD1 with the impact of our filtrate quality on FTF. So despite the fact that when we actually um, installed our belt filter presses, we specifically have the filtrate um, lined separate from the filtrate wash water to keep the quality better. Unfortunately, because we have such a limited capacity in our feed tanks, and even though that uh, feed is coming all the way from the south part of the plant up to us at filtrate, uh, it stays in suspension quite well. So we dealt with um, the repercussions of high TSS in our feed and 
uh, you can see in these images, the one on the left is actually our empty feed tank, which is 30 feet. And so there's several feet of um, solids or belt press material on the bottom there. Now, when they were in design as well, there was a question about whether we had sinking or floating solids. It turns out that we were the lucky ones that got both. Um, so you can see and expect that the floating solids, um, I'm sorry, the sinking solids is gonna accumulate in the feed tanks and in our reactors. And we'll so show some better pictures in the future there, but um, our, our floating solids, we tried to mitigate um, both of these issues by installing a lamella plate settler down by the solids process over by the belt filter presses. Unfortunately, that's where we really saw the ramifications of these floating solids. So we got to a situation where we were only able to run these lamella plate settlers for a short period of time before we just became overloaded with sinking and floating solids and decommissioning them. So we're see, we'll see in the next slide here um, the unfortunate impacts of those floating solids. So the sinking solids accumulate and they're easy to deal with. Um, unfortunately, the floating layer interfered um, substantially with the decanters, actually pushing it out of the water interface. It required frequent repriming of our decanters, which um, is a manual process. So we resolved to leaving a slow amount of PSW running to the decanter at all times which then required us to do calculations specifically um, to determine our treated volume for ODs. We had to look at our feed flow rates and not our decanted rates because we were adding a substantial amount of water to the reactor through this means of constantly priming the decanters. Um, we also had, a, as you can see in the right image, um, we had many instances where that floating solids interfered with that, that um, instrument float and coded it, which interfered with accurate control. But more than that, occasionally would also push that out of the reactor surface. So in order to reintroduce these floating solids, we would run our cycle and feed pump and pumps in recycle, again, while maintaining a vigilant eye on our anamox size. But we also um, manipulated our mixer speeds so that we could provide surface turbulence to reintroduce those floating solids into the liquid layer. Um, unfortunately, all of these approaches really, while they do provide solutions, they in turn require a lot more um, time there and visual observation. Again, we're talking about five or six reactors when we're discussing filtrate treatment. And um, the behavior of each of them is very different, not only biologically, but you're gonna see we talk a lot about physical mechanical problems that we observe. Um, and that was, I think that's highlighted really well in this next picture as well, where we have um, excess polymer carrying over from our belt presses, which would actually billow up on the top of the reactors. This occasionally would trigger false high levels um, and create an inability to feed or fill our reactors. It would carry AOBs, NOBs, and at times Anamox with it to coat the sides of the reactors um, and the walkways, the bottom of the walkways, and therefore losing biology by carrying it up in this foam and distributing it in places that it's not useful when it's not in our um, homogeneous reactor. Again, we can use our cyclone feed pump to knock this down, um, but if you get too much coating, you end up with uh, Anamox that looks like it does on my filter in the right picture here. Essentially, if you have this sticky polymer coating your Anamox, you get these really large colonies that form huge clumps. And obviously, if that Anamox is producing nitrogen gas and it doesn't have the ability for it to off gas because it's trapped now in there, that Anamox is gonna pop and rise to the top of the reactor and it's gonna be wasted right out there through the decanter. Both solutions in this case is to run our cyclone feed pump, whether it is to physically knock down the foam or to shear the Anamox and get that uh, excess polymer coating off. Um, we also installed in one of our reactors a spray header system um, where we use PSW to knock down some of the foam. We'll talk about why we didn't expand on that spray header used to other reactors as Miguel starts outlining OD2 for us. Thank you. All right, so after we came across a couple of those issues um, after OD1 and after we 
uh, went with the ramp up of two other reactors for OD2, or after we started up the ramp up of two more reactors, we started OD2. Now, originally we said we were going to start off with reactors two and five for this, but um, we ended up with some decanter failures, which I'll get into uh, later on. And we decided to shift over to reactor four and six instead and push that loading. Um, the overall setup between uh, OD1 and two in terms of like grab, grab samples and whatnot were very similar. The only difference again is that we took two reactors and really pushed them to their limits by uh, giving them a, a, a loading rate of 0.6 kilograms of ammonia per day per meter cubed. Um, essentially where if the other reactors during OD1 were given like 200, milligram, uh, 200 gallons per minute of feed at 1,000 uh, milligrams per liter of ammonia in the feed tank, the um, these two reactors during OD2 got twice as much, up to like 400, 450 uh, gallons per minute of feed at about 1,000 milligrams per liter of influid ammonia. Um, during this time, we also had to kind of reduce the feed to the other reactors and even suspend reactor one because we only had so much inventory um, at this point and we didn't want to risk lowering the feed tank too much. Um, we also, due to some some confidence issues that we had in the results of, or in the consistencies of OD1, we added another external lab um, to the second OD. So we used two external labs. We used our Hawk and we used our internal DC water lab in order to verify um, the results from OD2. Uh, the, uh, the, the labs analyzed influent ammonia, effluent ammonia, NO2, NO3 in these two reactors. Boop. After uh, all in all, though, uh, we, as we can see from the table, the total removal rates um, were really good for the two reactors once they actually got uh, doing what we, we needed them to do. They passed with flying colors. Uh, via the contract, um, the combined and uh, the combined ammonia removal was supposed to be 72 percent and the total nitrogen removal was supposed to be 63 three, uh, 62%, but they averaged 86 and 83 respectively, even a maximum of both over 90%, which was fantastic. Um, we were very confidently surprised uh, with the results of this, um, where the, uh, the total pounds per day for OD2, for like for OD2 was supposed to be somewhere between 7,552 pounds. Um, it actually ended up treating over 9,000 pounds of ammonia per day. So that was 19.3% higher than the actual design. Again, despite some of the issues that we've had, once the, bi once the biology can get to that point, they become very very self-sufficient and very effective. It's just getting to that point is uh, the tricky part. Uh, this graph here is a uh, just a graphical representation of the data that was presented uh, before, um, where the, we have the loading rates on the Y and the time on the X. Uh, and well above the the six the point six loading rate that we require that we needed. So they were a they not only were they treating higher than what the actual OD required, they actually treated better than what the contract required. So overall, um, great. Uh, I did want to mention that we also have another large gap here um, in between uh, in the early early parts of this OD because of another issue that we've had, which I'm going to get to in the moment, but. Same as uh, OD1, um, all we did was take a pause and we picked up right where we left off after we were able to take care of that situation. But yeah, overall, um, OD2 came out to a great success. Um, there we go. So the lessons learned, um, just like OD1, we had issues with foaming. It is again revealed its ugly head. Excess foaming in the feed tank or in the feed tank and the reactors were particularly bad for OD2. 
um, because these two reactors were pushed so much. They received twice as much flow as any of the reactors in OD1. So one can only assume that they were hit that much harder with these floating and sinking solids issues. As you can see on the image on the left, like it got to the point where it overflowed onto the catwalk. Um, it was at this point that we realized like, okay, we can't just use a spray header or, um, or they're like trying to reintroduce, we have to add an anti-foam uh, uh, agent in order to help keep this uh, from happening, especially at least during the ODs. And this is something we have to do every day without fail. Like we even had to come in over the weekend to add anti-foam during this uh, OD period to make sure that this kind of issue um, didn't happen. And the ever so pop, uh, uh, scary decanter failures. So um, one of the other issues that we had during OD1 and OD and during the ramp up in OD2 was, was the decanter issues. Um, it started off with uh, reactor five. As soon as OD1 was done, um, we noticed that there was an issue with the reactor or with the decanter where we were with, with your actor, I should say that we were losing biology. Then we didn't really quite know what was going on. And it took us a while to realize, Oh, our decanters are falling off. And we didn't even really notice it until we saw something similar to what is on the image on the left happen, where it was literally just floating off in the middle of the reactor. And here, there in the square, you can see that this particular decanter got to the point where it was bumping into the uh, mixer. The very, very scary moment. Um, reactor, after five broke in August of 2019, um, we had it removed by DMS and we were working with uh, World Waterworks and Tri Schreiber to try and figure out like what was the cause of the failure. At first, it was thought due, it, it was due to like, um, the foaming and the floating solids pushing the decanter past the high operating level and causing like um, excessive strain on that arm that you that we see here. Um, and we tried to make some we tried to uh, uh, do an, a structural analysis on it and readjust our high operating level to try and like mitigate this issue. We went from like twenty seven. Um, feet to 26.5 feet, you know, half a foot to try and like make up for it. But it was hard to really tell what was going on with so much um, in the way. You can't really see with the uh, floating, uh, with the floating solids and the foam. Um, in the meantime, we had to add a temporary riser, which we'll get to the details on that later, um, in order to like continue using the reactor. Right, because if there was no decanter, there's no way to actually use the reactor. Um, however, after all this, later in December 2019, we then lost two and three. Now, mind you, this late 2019 period is when we were trying to ramp up for OD2. So not even to the point where we got to OD2, we lost three out of the six decanters. So yeah, very scary time. And it was really at this point is where we shifted from trying to do two and um, five for OD2 to four and six. And uh, I, I, I think we got lucky. Somehow the, the decanter decided to hold on just long enough for us for it to finish OD2 because it wasn't until August of 2019 that we lost the decanters in five and six. I guess it really didn't want to fail us. And it was just, just I'm going to hold on, I'm going to hold on. And um, it was just a couple weeks after we officially finished OD2, did the decanter from these guys break off, like weeks apart. Um, yeah, losing these decanters were a serious blow to our productivity at FTF. Um, Shauna is gonna go into a little bit more details as to what these losses meant for us and how our temporary solution is working and what we're trying to do in order to better ourselves here on out. Thanks, Miguel. So one thing I wanted to mention is um, with the failure of decanter six, you'll notice 
or you may have noticed when Miguel was going through the unique startup phases, that Reactor 6 essentially only went through wet testing and then through OD2's performance with biology in it. So while we were trying to mitigate and ensure that we weren't ever going above that high operating level um, as being the potential cause of the sleeve failure and this decanter essentially floating away, um, Reactor 6 realistically only had four to six months of continuous operation, never exceeding that high operating level and still failed. So at that point, we really knew we needed to come up with a cost-effective, quick solution to get by as we are now sitting with uh, reactors two through five without decanters. Reactor one has managed to stay functional. Um, And so we came up with this quick solution where after we removed the decanters with the crane um, and dewatered it, we installed a we inverted the existing elbow vertically and then just installed a, a five foot riser with a support um, and we extended it up as high as we could below our overflow pipe. So the um, height of that pipe is essentially 22 feet in the reactor. Um, and then we continued operating. Uh, we put material back in them and we were in really good shape thinking, well, perhaps because we have this 22 feet of working volume, um, we'll be able to get by. Maybe we don't need these decanters. Unfortunately, after a few months of operating with the riser configuration, we did see a very rapid decrease in performance and it was pretty simple to um, visually confirm that it was because we were wasting AOBs and NOBs and unfortunately Animox. Um, Miguel, you think the video will run there? So you can see here during a decant cycle, and you can hear me talking apparently, that unfortunately as you approach that 22 feet, you have a lot of turbulence there. You're sucking in. Well, it's great for our floating solids problem, right? So we haven't really talked a whole lot about having issues with floating fo- foam or floating solids because we now are able to easily waste them out of the reactor, which is great. Unfortunately, if you have popping Animox um, in combination with this now riser configuration, Right there, you'll see our floating Animox. That is absolutely devastating to the reactor health because you can simply miss one decant and come into a reactor that now is barely able to um, function for you at those those previous loads. So uh, another means of mitigating biological loss is that we have reduced um, all of the operation of these reactors with the exception of reactor one to only decant once a day in that 24 hour cycle. So unfortunately we're essentially um, limited to a five foot working volume. Um, And overall we're able to treat about a million gallons a day from filtrate um, at that, those concentrations we've discussed, but we are always not fully treating our available filtrate load at this current configuration with our, our riser pipes as our intermediate solution. Um, What our hope is, I'll discuss that in the next slide, but we don't wanna forget that we still, um, we've talked extensively about our sinking and floating solids. Can you go to that next slide for me, Miguel? Thank you. So we've continued to have ongoing feed issues and we've tried to resolve those through a couple means. The simple one was starting out fresh by dewatering our feed tanks, dewatering some of our reactors and physically removing the solids from the bottom of them using a vac truck. Um, We actually got to a situation where some of our influent feed lines to reactors as well as our LITs for our pressure um, transducer level indicators were clogged with this um, floating material. So we actually had to dewater some of our reactors to remove the material. Um, in that time, we've added a bypass or a feed tank flushing scenario. So essentially we added a connection between our influent, our common influent line for all six reactors directly to our effluent line. Uh, we have an actuator. So now when we grab a feed tank quality sample that looks like that bottom right image that's clearly black and has felt filter breast material in it, we start a flushing protocol. Um, we flush our feed tanks out until we get a good quality sample that looks like T, like you see in that top right image. Um, we've also, we're also installing a Surlic analyzer to to establish a baseline TSS. Um, We don't have a great deal of confidence that it'll be accurate, but realistically, we just need to know what that T-like quality number is versus when you see this rapid change from the belt press quality. Um, And then you can have a rate of change alarm in PCS, which will give 
more of a proactive alarm for our operators rather than a reactive um, to a poor grab sample because typically you're grabbing these samples at nine o'clock each morning and you've you potentially have missed um, 24 hours of operation where you're feeding poor quality into your reactors. Our long-term solution for the riser is actually to move away from sequencing batch reactors into continuous flow. So um, we are in the midst of working with a specialty firm to prepare a computational fluid dynamics model, which has a baffle wall. And um, our concern is because there's this parabolic mixing that happens at the bottom of the reactor, if we put the baffle wall in the far end, um, what could happen is we could have short circuiting up the back of that wall and actually send Animox out um, during continuous overflow configuration. And some of our initial simulations actually showed that, that preferential flow, that there's a, a decent amount of mixing that's going to happen. So what we're doing is working through simulations now. Um, in an attempt to design this wall so that we could have a, uh, a deflector plate at the bottom and mitigate the potential issues of that. And if that's reasonable, if we can get to a place where we have this configuration such that um, the CFD may be agreeable enough, to, we're going to move towards piloting this in um, one of our reactors. We've had an unfortunate go of things. A lot of these physical mechanical things didn't transpire in the pilots that research we're doing realistically because we're talking about 30 foot deep reactors, 27 foot deep reactors. So everything wasn't translating. So before we make any real investment, we're going to do a full full scale pilot in one of the reactors. In the meantime, we are going to um, make two of the existing decanters more robust. So while reactor one is still available and functional, we'll dewater it. We'll put in lateral supports so that we have um, uh, essentially, we don't have that instance where the sleeve can fail and then float away in the reactor. Mm -hmm. Did I get all those points? Yep. yep. So um, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and being an engineer, being a PE that does more operation stuff, I feel bad for design engineers because uh, you can't learn these things unless you go through them. So. Uh, what we would have liked to have is a CFD because we mentioned a few times that we have a unique combination of uh, equipment and that invent aeration mixers, the decanters, and the neuros blowers. And if you were to visually see um, these decanters in the reactors during a decant, there was definitely um, turbulence in the lateral lat lateral movement of these decanters all the time. And so we wish we had gone through that step prior to um, equipment selection. Mm -hmm. uh, the other key takeaway I hope you've been able to gather is you really need a process champion. Um, it requires a level of attention and understanding that's not typical of continuous flow operation. You really need someone that can, um, Miguel and I always joke that there are babies. Um, you really need someone that can pay close attention to this. Realistically for us, our shift work operators um, they're here two days, they're gone two, they're back three, they're gone two, and they may not be at the same station for six to eight weeks. So a failure like some of the ones we've seen or a, a foaming event can re result in drastically different biology and behavior in one of those six reactors. Um, so you really need someone that can um, pay close attention to it. And also that champion needs to be able to train and work through issues with the operators. What we've started doing now is when we have these hiccups, we specifically call operators over to train them through those instances um, because when things are working, it is pretty self-reliant. But when they're not, when they're going bad, you need to draw on these experiences and help them say, when you have this foaming event, we had this amount of anti-foam in this manner. Or when we have bad quality, we do this protocol. It's really important for the viability of this process in a sequencing batch reactor configuration to work. I can only imagine it will be more involved when we have continuous flow through. Um, and something simple uh, like inadequate buffer or, or equalization, um, we just also don't even have the ability to remove solids easily from the reactors or feed tanks. Our feed tanks are actually sloped to a sump that is the feed for our feed pumps to all of our reactors. So all of that sinking solids, we essentially are funneling into 
the influent of the feed pump. We could have just inversely sloped them, uh, left a submersible in there, something that's more realistic and easier to remove this uh, material from the bottom of a 30-foot deep reactor. Having the ability to bypass or flush, key, adding it in after the fact has made things much easier. Before, we'd actually have to feed to an empty reactor and then decant it out to get rid of it or to flush our feed tank, which took more time than our current configuration with the change. And um, simple stuff like individual sample lines for each reactor. So all of our effluents combined during all of this testing, when you really want to know about your reactor performance, you have to time it specifically to get to decant sample. Doing that during a 30 minute decant of six reactors that can only decant two at a time takes you at least an hour and a half. Sometimes you don't have an operator's ability to be there at a particular time for two hours. So those are kind of things we wanted to highlight. Um, I think sometimes uh, a lot of this stuff is, is lost because we aren't able to convey it to the folks that are making the design changes or the design decisions. And so we hope that we were able to highlight a more practical approach to Animox operation. Um, and Miguel and I are open to answering questions if you have any. Sorry, that took us a little longer than we were anticipating. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, now we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, if you have a question, just type it in on the left-hand side of your screen where it says attendee chat. And Miguel and Shauna will answer as many as they can. We only have a couple minutes left, but um, also if you would like to email them directly with questions, their email addresses, um, well, they were on the screen, but we will, um, you can always email me and we can get them to you. Yeah, it's essentially just our names at DC Water. It's easy to okay. remember. Great. So I see three questions there, the attendee chat. You guys can just take a look at those oh, and um, just answer. How do I do that? Uh, oh, I see it. It's in the middle column, right, where it says attendee. Okay. Ah. Uh, the first one says, what percent of return rate you find is good for your system? Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't quite understand what you mean by return rate. I guess while you clarify, I can answer another question. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, excellent. Oh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, when you started on this path in 2019, DC Water expected cost saving. Have these been realized? Um, oh, there we go. Sorry, the chat's moving around, bouncing around a bit. Okay, so um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, yes, we have seen an overall uh, less usage of um, of chemical for like methanol, just because of the overall like biology that's being put back into the beginning of the plant. The exact numbers, I don't know off the top of my head, but the general feeling that we've been having as an organization is when they were work, when the reactor and when the biology is working as intended, we did see um, cost savings. Yeah, if you plot actually our methanol feed pumps during one of our instances of bypass of filtrate, you can see that uptick. Um, but mm -hmm. we don't really look at the metrics for cost saving on our chemicals. We have someone whose whole role is that. So I can't quantify mm -hmm. it exactly for exactly. you guys. I do see what amount of Animox are you wasting? And is DC water using it at a seed material for other facilities? That's a really good question. I should have said um, our wasting actually goes back to main the main process. So it's routed to nitrification, denitrification. Mm -hmm. um, some of those operators, and you can see some of the Animox in the rafters over there. Um, there's there's claim that there's a benefit, but realistically, we want to make sure that we're getting the benefit of our AOBs and NOBs over at night D night. Um, and we do actually provide seed material for other facilities. Essentially, we're required to um, give them the opportunity to ask us. And if we have the ability to provide it based on where our performance is, we do provide it. So right now, actually this month, we'll be providing some seed to Chile because they're installing uh, a demon system uh, on their, they have two plants that they're installing over there. So last year we provided that with seed and um, there's some discussion about providing um, WSSC with some, and there's a plant in New York that also has a request. So yes. they send us tanker trucks as Miguel had mentioned, and we fill those up and then we send them to them. 
Yes. Uh, what amount of animals are you wasting? Is DC water using... Oh, wait, no. Okay, we already yep. answered them. I think those are uh, repeated. Oh, I see. Is DC water using... Uh, yeah, okay. So you told a funny story about the longer than expected travel time. How much long do you expect this was? And did you see a longer than anticipation hibernate, yeah, hibernation mode? Um, yeah. Where so what was supposed to be... I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Shauna, what was supposed to be like two weeks or so ended up being like almost a month, a month and a half. I think we we're supposed yeah, to get I, it. I think travel took three times as long. Yeah. Um, but realistically, all of our our tankers. So we got several shipments. Only one of them went to Washington State. Realistically, our biology sat for what four to six months before we actually mm -hmm. started seeding because we were having problems. A few problems we haven't even talked about. Um, but <laughs> the 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 OD1 data and the ramp up data sort of demonstrates specifically how well they hibernate. Even though they sat there without food, um, we were able to slowly ramp them up. So I don't think that impacted our performance. It probably slowed it down, but at the end of the day, we got the, the seed quantity we needed. Miguel, how are you seeing? Oh, okay. I do see that chat now. I'm like, it's not. <laughs> Yeah, um, in terms of like just like ante anticipated hibernation mode uh, intended versus what actually happened, um, since no one's really like kind of done this thing before, at least at this large of a scale, we can only assume that just because it's been sitting there that much longer, it just took that much longer to wake up. Like it took three months before we really saw a six, uh, significant um, animox production so I, if we got everything when we were supposed to and we were if we started when we were supposed to i can only imagine that it only would have taken a few weeks instead of a few months was there any follow-up to the percent of return rate you find good for your system wait where do you oh. see that that was the first one. I wasn't sure oh. if Ricardo had followed up. Um, Kelly just asked, was recirculation through the hydrocyclins adequate for shearing the large granule aggregates with polymer? And did you have to change polymer dosing? Uh, um, yes, it is. Uh, the, it did too the much, of, actually. Yeah, this, the sort of rule of thumb we have is um, we make very small increases uh, one day at a time. So when it comes to feeding, we never increase a feed flow by more than 10%. When we add wasting or recycle time, because the shearing is actually so aggressive from the um, submersible pump and the screen, we only add it at 10 minute increments. Um, and so we're we're paying close attention to the size of our Animox on our filter paper each day and then changing those inputs. And there are times where we'll put 30 minutes in and uh, only a few days later, we'll actually have to remove that wasting or recycle time altogether mm -hmm. because you're actually physically seeing a drastic change in the Animox. Yeah. So realistically, you see each day the result of your wasting time. So it's, it's definitely mm -hmm. adequate for shearing. Um, as far as polymer dosing goes, realistically, we're yeah. sort of second rate, right, Miguel? So <laughs> Yeah, we don't control um, that. They, uh, in solids, as long they're their priority for polymer dosing is, are they getting good cake? Um, and yeah. we really have to sort of just deal with what what it looks like to us at Filtrate, yeah. I mean, we have a little bit of a sway in terms of like, if, it's, if, if sometimes they just do like a knee jerk reaction kind of pull, like we can try and convince it, but generally speaking, they have control over the polymer rates we don't. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, let's um, see. This I love Paul's comment. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of decanters, the estimate of 4,000 pounds of stainless steel equipment, your welding, does this technology demand more than we might expect in daily operation? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Specifically, if you have a large facility where we have rotating shifts, go ahead, Miguel, talk about that for us. Yeah, no, yeah, you're, you're about to hit it right on the money. Like, <laughs> for Sean and I, who have been involved with this since the very beginning, um, the the we've gotten so used to it and we've really became that process champion that we were mentioning before for us we're able to handle and deal with the day-to-day -day activities relatively easy but again it took us years to get to this point it and we're there every day unlike our 
operators who are constantly shifting around and are not there on a normal day-to-day basis, the demand for someone like them with their schedule, it starts getting really, it really does start demanding a lot more. Um, And the technology itself, or at least like learning the technology and getting familiar with it and um, kind of learning their nuances like sean was mentioning each one of these reactors are like their own individual child they all act different they're all being fed the same amount of food they're all have the same equipment associated to them but they all act differently so the technology does does demand a lot for someone who's not there that often yeah that's the biggest takeaway as folks come Mm -hmm. to look at our application i always ask what their um facility looks like. I think it'd be more reasonable if you had someone who was responsible for an area, even like for Miguel and I's level of effort, um, we're divided by process areas, what our responsibility is. So this is like about a a fourth of our, of the area that we're responsible for. And it's a a pretty big workload on, on us as a team. And we actually have someone else in operations, Chris Cusick, who's been really helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. but definitely want to caution based on size and scale. Now, if we're talking about one reactor and your flows are uh, liters per minute, which is what a lot of the presentations that (laughs) folks made to us were, were, it's definitely reasonable. But when you supersize stuff, you get supersized problems. Yep. And the Uh, the 4,000 pounds is not estimated. That's what the crane said when it pulled it out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, another question is that you mentioned you sent samples to labs for analysis. Where are you characterizing the microbes and anamox population in the reactors? Um, when we were sending it for the lab, that the the anamox population and the micro AOB population wasn't a requirement for the ODs in order to like know exactly how they were. We kind of just assumed if they were performing to the level that was required, then you had enough population. Um, like we were mentioning before, the thing with Animox is that they are robust when there's a lot of them. So during these ODs, there are definitely enough of them to, for them to do what they needed to do. Yeah, so our analysis was specifically looking at nitrogen speciation, so ammonia, yep. NO2, NO3. Um, we were looking at orthophosphate as well as TSS um, at our, our, our lab here. Mm-hmm. Um, and the activity sampling that you see in some of our graphs was done mostly um, for research. And essentially, we yeah. have a bunch of research students that are often um, utilizing the Animox for some of their uh, PhD or dissertation support. So it depends on if we have a research um intern or research student that can come and grab samples and do activity testing for us. And to be quite honest, there's such a delay, sort of like the external lab, that we don't really use the activity sampling or the activity testing to drive our performance. We really use our HOC numbers, so our real-time ammonia and NO2 are key. Um, But more so, you kind of look at it and you know what you do or don't have. So we're creating cheat sheets for our operators where you have these white um, cone filters. Just they're just coffee filters, really. Um, And you have, you know, large, medium or small Animox. You qualitatively record that in eLogger or you have um, a lot, a moderate or a little amount. And that allows you to sort of gauge your inventory more. World Waterworks usually tries to get their um, applications to, what's it called, Miguel, washing the Animox? Yeah. So to take a prescribed 100 milliliter sample um, or a liter sample and actually separate out your Animox and quantify um, how much of that sample was Animox by volume, we've never, ever been able to do that <laughs> because our, our sinking solids settle at the same rate as the Animox. So it's impossible to qualitatively determine how much Animox you have. We tried. Yeah. Didn't work. No one's ever going to want to do this now, Miguel. (laughs) (laughs) At least not as this big of a scale. Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, guys. I think that's it for the questions. Great presentation. Uh, We really appreciate it. And uh, our next webinar is scheduled for July 28th, where students from the University of California, Merced, will discuss COVID-19 and how it affects our environment, health, and equity. 
Uh, the page to register for that webinar will be open, will, can be opened as soon as this session ends, and it's also on our website. Uh, that wraps up our event for today, and thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I get out of here.